Now, I've been joined in studio by a gentleman who got some good news uh, this week and has been in the paper for uh, over his birthday party, would you believe, as well. Shay Healy, good morning to you. Good you morning. were inducted into IMRO. Yes. Mean a lot to you? Uh, absolutely. Uh, they set up a thing called the Academy it's like a Hall of Fame. I suppose what really can't... It, it's your peers that, that bestowed this upon you. Mm. And... Um, I looked at the people who were there. There was Paul Brady, Jimmy McCarthy, Pete St. John, Phil Coulter, Ray Harmon. And the quality of the songs, the hits that came out of it, mm. was just astounding. So uh, I felt very tough to be in such august company. Right, OK. The, um, I just want to go to the phone there for a second, if you care to put on your headphones. Yeah. Because there's a gentleman that wants to talk to you. Billy Connolly, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, nice to talk to you. How did you get to know this chap, Shay Healy? Well, we were both stuck with a gig in Massachusetts in a restaurant bar complex that had kind of folk music sort of uh, to entertain the public. And uh, I, I was going crazy because what they wanted to hear was the Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. And I... I bumped into Shea in the middle of all this and he had suffered from the Danny Boy syndrome. <laughs> and, right. And so we found with a lot in common and became friendly very quickly. I understand that he, he did, that the term he was talking about was musical diplomacy. Was that what it was, Shea? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Gently took him aside and uh, had a quiet word with him. <laughs> the, the, the thing was that yeah, I worked it out. The first time I went to America to sing, I sang for 28 days and I died three times a night for 28 days because I wouldn't do it their way. They wanted Danny Boy and, and if you're Irish, come into the parlour. And I said, no. I worked it out that if I do one for them, I could do three for me. Right. So it was a good deal, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I castigated Billy in the paper. I said he, he insisted on singing the Battle of Bannockburn, which is 122 verses long. So what effect did that have on your performance, Billy? Oh, it was drastic. Eventually I gave in and I rewrote The Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. I, I wrote about seven verses to it, so as I could keep getting the chorus by Yon Bonnie Banks and by Yon <laughs> Bonnie Braze. So by writing seven verses, I got the chorus eight times and it kind of kept me going for a while. Right. You recorded one of Shay's um, songs as well. Three? You recorded three. No, I'm thinking of the first one. Yeah. What was it, the Half Stone Cowboy? Uh, the Country and Western Super Song? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> About the boy going over the hill in the wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, your granny being a cripple in... Nashville. In Nashville. That's right, and, and, with, the, and, the, and with the blind orphan. <laughs> yeah, he writes very good songs. <laughs> like the Duodenal Walls and the Half Stone Cowboy. Um, you stay there for a moment, please, because I want to talk to Phil Coulter as well. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, William. Nice to talk to you. Now, you are, are friendly with the two of these people. I am indeed for my sins. I must have done something bad in an early life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell, um. tell me about the dinosaurs. Dinner. Ah, yeah, that came about. Billy was... Uh, was uh, Good morning, gentlemen, by the way. Good morning, good morning sir. Billy was, in, Billy was uh, in town doing some recording at Ardmore, which is just around the corner from us. And, and uh, I said, Billy, when you're in town, why don't you come up to the house and see Geraldine and the kids for a bite to eat? So Billy arrived at the house thinking he was going to have a quiet uh, dinner in the Coulters, and I, t I ushered him into the, the, the sitting room, and there was Ralph McTell, Shay Healy, Christy Moore, Paul Brady, uh, Ronnie Drew... Pat Egan and another a few more uh, were reprobate. So we had we had just one of those glorious evenings of a coming together of of guys who have a lot in common, don't see each other um, all the time, but have a great there's a great camaraderie, a great brotherhood, and a lot of a lot of laughs. I had to throw them out at four o'clock in the morning because I was flying to Boston and the following day. But uh, can I add a little line to that? Yeah. Girl? I remember uh, when we went outside when we were leaving, we were standing around outside your front door, and I always remember Christy wasn't drinking. I wasn't drinking that night. Um, Jim McCann wasn't drinking. And Ronnie said, Jeez, lads, if this was ten years ago, we'd all be bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> and why weren't people drinking? Just to age had set in, or what? Uh, age had set in, various little concert times had happened along the way. 
Murray, and there's a there's a there's a lot, lot of stories there. I think you'd need a long a long program to go into all the ins and outs of that particular situation. Well, well I'm sure I'm sure as would. Um, Shay also gave your wife Geraldine a bit of a break when she was starting out. Oh, that's that's one of her favourite stories. When, when the very very early days of of the Brannigans herself and her two brothers, uh, Donal and Declan. Declan was only sixteen. And uh, Shay was giving them well, probably their well, maybe their first ever break. Shay, the impresario, Shay Healy, um, had a gig up in Donegal, and he had he had he had told the Brannigans, right, kids, this is a, this is your big shot. So on the Sunday lunchtime, Shay pulled up outside the Brannigans with his car to drive northwards, and uh, as they were leaving the leaving the house. Uh, Geraldine's dad spots that Declan, who is now, as I say, 16, still at school, is leaving, sneaking out with the guitar. He says, hey, boy, where are you going? Get you back in there and do your homework. So the Brannigan trio quickly became a duo. Um, but Shay, man, man enough, took them on still as a duo. And I, I asked Gerald, the big question I asked Gerald, did you still get paid? Which they did, Shay, I'm delighted to report. What a noble guy. <laughs> <laughs> big break. Where was that, or do you even remember? It was someone in Donegal, yeah, and, uh... I felt called Sean Clancy driving us there. Um, but we thought nothing of, of going to Donegal and coming back in the night. And in fact, the show band would go to Donegal tonight and they would be in Falcar the following night, but they'd still come back to Dublin and go back up. It's a killer of lifestyle, wasn't it? Uh, extraordinary, really, yeah. And in the beginning, like, they, they would all share the van and then it changed from being a co-op band to to a wages band where the, the big star was getting the money and, and the grunts were travelling in the van and the star was allowed to go in his car. <laughs> yeah, we, there were a couple of those cooperative bands, weren't there? there were, when the they, all, when they started out, the Dixies, the, the Royal, yeah. they had all been co-ops. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember Christy and um, Keith Donald and all those in their band. That was another one of those, wasn't it? Uh, Moving uh, Hearts. Uh, the Real McCoy. Um that was Keith and Keith actually was in a, a very serious car crash when he was with the real McCoy and he was on the table and he died technically for two minutes and he didn't particularly like the show bands but he was good he was studying in, in Trinity so when he was going up and down the van he was able to, to study his books you know so I said to him I said what was the best time you had in the show bands he said I think it was the two minutes that I was technically dead <laughs> and he was at least at least she <clears throat> At least he only died once, not like you who died three times a night. Oh, stop. Don't remind me. How did you and Billy Connolly end up together, Phil? Um, well, I was... I was <laughs> under protest, I, have to, I had a phone call from a man called Frank Lynch, who was then a managing Billy. He was also managing a band called Slick with Midgeur as the as the singer. And he, he called me up and said, Phil, we're delighted we're number one in the charts with Slick, but listen, I need you to do me a favour. I'm, I'm looking after this other uh, act who's making a lot of lot of noise up here. He's 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 uh, he's a folk singer, really, but he tells gags in between the, the 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 songs. He's really very funny, and I really need you to come up and make a live album. And my my reaction was, Frank, are you having a laugh? I said, you know, Slick are number one on the charts here. I've got the Bay City Rollers and uh, taken off in America. I need to make albums and sell millions of records. And you want me to come up to Glasgow and record a folk singer who thinks he's funny? What's his name? <laughs> he said, Billy Connolly. Well, I went up and, and uh, well, I, I decided, I figured that within the first couple of minutes of recording Billy, that he was the funniest man on the planet. And I still believe that all these years later. And he's, he's, he's one of my dear friends. So it was a... Uh, it was a good. It was a good conversation on the phone. I'm delighted that Franklin's persuaded me out of my out of my doubts. You remember that, Billy? I remember it very well indeed. It was a King's Theatre in Glasgow. I remember being delighted when I heard that Phil had fallen on the controls in the in the van. At one point, <laughs> just with laughter. That's absolutely true. I ruined I ruined the first half hour of the take because I'd fallen over the controls. I just I threw away the the clipboard, threw away my my. I was very well organised with a clipboard and a stopwatch. Threw them away and just in my laughter, I just fell over the engineer and fell over the uh, the controls and we lost like a good fifteen minutes of the show. But I was I became a Connolly fan right then and I've, I've never wavered. <clears throat> and Billy, fr from your perspective, I mean, did you? I mean, did you really want Phil Coulter, or did it all happen by accident? Well, I wasn't actually sure what a producer did, you know. <laughs> he, he, he just, he came in and he was very nice to me, and he went out and sat in the van and came back with these raging tales of falling over the equipment. And I took him for a curry, and I, 
life went merrily forward. <laughs> it, it, it was quite easy, really. <laughs> and and how? When was that in terms of your career? It was the. It was just about the time before I did the Mike Parkinson show and kind of launched myself into the British public eye. Mm. It was just before I kind of, as they say, made it in Britain, and uh, it was it was it launched me really. It was it was a smashing record that sold amazingly well. And and as they say, the rest is history. Uh, Paul Brady, good morning to you. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, everybody. How did you and uh, Shay join up forces? Well, I met Shay first when I joined the Johnstons. I was, I was, it was a very exciting time in my life because I was a student at UCD and suddenly, uh, I mean, I had been playing with R&B bands, uh, blues bands around the city instead of going to lectures. And suddenly I got this invitation to join a chart-topping band in Ireland and I was meeting all these, these new people. And uh, Shay was one of the people I met at the time uh, because he was writing songs and he, I remember... Uh, Adrian, the singer of the band, was in a flat in Leahy Terrace in Sandy Mount, and Shay came along one day with a couple of songs for us. We were going to make a new record, and one of the songs we eventually recorded, which was called Funny in a Sad, Sad Way, and that was a song that you wrote, Shay, for, for Tony Hancock. I think he just passed away at the time. That's right, yeah. yeah. The great British comedian, and uh, it was a great song, and that's really was the beginning of a lifelong relationship between me and, and Shay, and uh, it's been one of my most important ones, I have to say. Uh, also, I met Billy around not too long after that, actually. I think, Billy, when you were... I met you when you were in the Humble Bums. That's right, we were Transatlantic Records. Yeah, we shared a record label in London, uh, the Johnson Transylvania Dundas. Records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and with uh, with Tom Harvey and and the Jerry Rafferty, and uh, so yeah, we we all go back a long way, <laughs> and it's full of laughter ever since. The humble bums, not the most <laughs> elegant of names, I would have thought. No, it didn't really suit Jerry and I, but it suited Tom and I. But I, I was t with Tom Harvey first, and uh, we we got the, the we came upon the word stumble bum to be a sort of hobo, and I, I liked it. And then another guy suggested humble bum, so we did it. It's the kind of thing I'd expect from you, Jay. Yeah, no, they had humble bums was great. They had a great uh, song called "Her Father Didn't Like Me Anyway." Am I right, Billy? That's right. I yeah. was Jerry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was such a good songwriter. It was, he did one of the real sad stories of show business, Jerry Rafferty. Uh -huh. When you say sad story? Well, he, he became a hopeless alcoholic and he died way too young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as has happened to, to, to quite a few in that line of business, hasn't it? it unfortunately, it seems to... Yeah, I was yeah. a hopeful alcoholic. I was kind of different. <laughs> <laughs> Could you explain, please? <laughs> I never got the hopelessness bit. No. <laughs> I'll tell you my favourite Shea story. He called, he, called, he called me in Scotland once, and he said he asked me, did I have a modern picture of myself, a photograph? And I said, sure, why do you want it? <laughs> he said, I've just done a great interview with you. <laughs> and they would like a photograph. <laughs> I said, how did I do? He said, oh, you were very funny. <laughs> <laughs> he interviewed me when I wasn't there. That's a good trick, isn't I, it? I think that was in the days of Spotlight magazine. It had become Starlight, and myself and one other guy writing the whole magazine. One week I'd write the letters to the editor, and he'd respond, and swap roles, and the horoscope cut it out of a comic, and just changed the months around every week. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I used to take four magazine interviews with Elvis and chop out all the quotes and put them down the floor and make a two-page, widely ranged interview with Elvis the man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No wonder we all trust the press. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I say no wonder we all trust the press. <laughs> did you did you do that really, just make makey-uppies all the way? Oh, they weren't makey-uppies. I mean, uh, 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 I think it probably... Pulled quotes from Billy from other places and, and fashioned right. an interview as opposed to fashioned. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fashioned. Well, that was a good thing. Did like you art. send him the photograph? 
Yes, of course I did. I was delighted. <laughs> Actually, we, we got so I like many, that kind of behaviour. We got sucked into a photograph recently. I, I asked Billy, would he do a, a photograph with me on Parkinson's Awareness Day? Because I call... My nickname for my Parkinson's is The Chat Show. And, uh, why, is it, why do you call it The Chat Show? Because Parkinson. Oh, gotcha. Sorry, and, slow and, on the uptake. So yeah. I said, here's two people who have differing opinions of Parkinson. Billy, it made him, and it started to undo me. So <laughs> that was the contrast. But when we got there, the PR guy pulled out a load of T-shirts, and we had to hold up a T-shirt, and it kind of ruined the intention, which was to be an elegant photograph. But we got two elegant photographs of us standing at two pillars, and we looked like two Ro Roman senators. Uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of happy, I think. That's all good. You you hit the the seven zero this year. I hit the seven zero. And and I think you did too, Billy. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Um, and me. And you. Mm, all oh right. Oh my God. That's two. I'm only a Wayne here. <laughs> 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 so so it would appear. You don't like it though, so you don't uh, Shay. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like seeing it, seeing it written down seventy. You know, I have a very funny story. Last last Sunday morning, um, John Bowman. Uh, paid me a little tribute. Yes, yeah. And a friend of mine, Kieran Fagan, was in his kitchen having a cup of tea, listening to John Bowman, and his wife came in and sat down and she said, Is she Healy dead? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, No, 70. <laughs> <laughs> so 70 is the new dead. Um. <laughs> no, dead's the new 90. <laughs> dead's the new 90? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm not so uncomfortable with it. I mean, it's just kind of—it's hard to imagine because you don't—you don't feel even close to seventy. But this bits of my body keeping the news every day. Take this seriously, pal. It's not going away. How is the Parkinson's at the moment? Um, it's not too bad, you know. Yeah. It has all kinds of little side effects that um, come from nowhere. Right. It's—it's it's annoying. And sometimes it's very, very difficult. I haven't been on an airplane for two years, and that is a real impediment to me, you know. But oh, it is very confining, yeah. isn't it? Why, why, why can't you go on an airplane? Well, my back starts to go crazy. Oh right. And then the rest of my body stiffens up. I mean, you, you get pretty stiff with Parkinson's anyway in the morning. I think the worst thing is when you wake. You know that glorious half second before your brain crashes into action, and then, oh shit, I have Parkinson's. I yeah. get I get through the day the best I can. Right. Yeah, but you, it certainly doesn't seem to have damaged your sense of humour because I read somewhere that you there was a party thrown for you. I think your wife threw My a party. Threw yeah. Fair play, what she did. And uh, that you said it was like going to your own funeral without having to die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it is. And even the the, the award ceremony last Monday was the same. I felt the same way. You know, here was a load of people that I might never see again, and we're all having a good time in the same room. So that was like another funeral. Right. Can I just say about that, that, that for, for a lot of us, a lot of our fellow songwriters there, I mean, there was a lot of very, t very talented guys on, on, on display there, a lot of great songs, etc. But for, I think I would, sp I, I would speak for the rest of the guys that one of the very, very, very special moments was to hear Shay sing and watch another year. It really was just, it, 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 was, it, was, it was magic. Standout part of the night for me. Thank you, Paul. I agree. You, mm -hmm. you, you figure so too, Paul. Oh yeah, just it was just there was a whole uh, sort of poignancy to the song which which uh, came out uh, in Shay's performance, which wasn't in the original recording. You know, much and all as I love that, mm -hmm. it was just uh, a whole different read on the song. You know, and uh, it's a powerful, powerful song. Do do you perform it much, or did you no, perform I, it much? I never sang it in public before last October, when Don Meskell brought me out on on tour with him. In uh, Waterford, in Tipperary, yeah. and um, he said one night, "Why don't you just sing? I just played the guitar for you." So I sang it, and the audience were kind of stunned, and they came up and said, "We've listened to the song a lot, but we never heard it before." Mm -hmm. And that was the significant difference. That, um, whatever way. Right. Now I, I have my own theory that, apart from being poignant, when you have somebody who has something wrong with them. There's a certain kind of prurient interest. Maybe it'd be like they'd fall over in the middle of it. <laughs> 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 to a Tommy Cooper. 
OK, well, listen, I'm going to have some other people that I want to get to, to also wish you a happy uh, birthday. Billy Connolly, just before you go, you're all over the papers today for what you describe as a Glaswegian moment. What was that with the photographer? Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of rude to a photographer in, in the Killarney. <laughs> and I didn't know it was a woman, actually, but because I could only see her in the shadows. She was halfway up the hall taking pictures of me and I told her to go away and she wouldn't <laughs> so I told her to go away properly in a Glaswegian way <laughs> it only takes two words <laughs> did you regret it? do I regret yeah. it? certainly not, I'm very proud of it ok, we leave it there you're in Cork tomorrow night I gather I am indeed, last night and, and tomorrow night oh it's, it's it's your last night in Ireland no no, last, I was on last night oh sorry, I, I beg your pardon then, yeah, yeah. OK, well, listen, thank you all very much indeed uh, for taking the call. As I say, it's to do with the birthday and it's to do with Imro and it's to do with all kinds of things like that. So Billy Connolly, Phil Coulter and Paul Brady, thank you very, very much indeed and we'll take a break. Welcome back to the programme. I'm with um, Shay Healy this morning, uh, marking his 70th birthday and his induction uh, into Imro, which obviously was... Uh, meant an awful lot to him. Now, next we are going to Boston and we're going to talk to Ronan Tynan of Tenor's fame uh, because you had connections through work as well. Ronan Tynan, good morning to you. It's very early morning there. Good morning, Marion. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Gosh, I'm alive. <laughs> now, what's your connection with Shay Healy? Uh, Shay and I go back a long way, but uh, uh, in many ways. I mean, Shay really was the one person who actually kind of introduced me in in, in the full way to, to Irish music and introduced my family to uh, to the listeners. And he did a documentary called Dr. Courageous. And um, Shea came into, uh, into my home and he was amazing. He, at that time, my father wasn't very well and he did a documentary that was so carefully handled and he got on famously with both my parents. Um, my father, as I said, wasn't dead, and my mother had Alzheimer's. And uh, they both loved him. They absolutely loved him. And the final product was a wonderful piece. Sadly, my father actually never saw it because he, he passed away just before it was released. And um, but she himself was just fantastic. His humor, his humor is electric. But he's talented as a writer, a composer, and, and a man who can interview you was well, just extraordinary. Do, do you recall doing that, Shay? I do. Uh, I, I was just very impressed with Ronan and, and his indomitable spirit that he had when making his way through the world, going on to become a de 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 doctor. And that the, the hesitation in my speech is... is the Parkinson doing his thing. All right. Okay. But um, he was a show jumper. This fascinated me. <laughs> I couldn't believe that this guy with no legs was a show jumper. And then he was doing the horse show, so we went along. And he had he had job perch and the false legs ready at the same time. The legs were already in the job perch. So he said he was going to jump at nine o'clock in the morning, the following morning. So at eight o'clock the following morning. I'm walking across, dawdling across the RDS with the camera crew. Right. And the next thing we hear, and the next competitor is Ron and Tyne from Kilkenny. Oh, James. <laughs> so we had to run, and we ran, and we got to the arena just as he came over the last jump and came through the finish. And we had to bring him back into the practice field, and we had to recreate the whole round of his jumping. And he <laughs> shot the lapses with pipes and uh, 3D ladies. And... Uh, Somehow or other, it came out at the end. Exactly, but he, he is amazing that he would get up and I know he breeds horses and uh, he's a big, he's a larger than life character and he, he leaves a great mark wherever he goes. I remember the other thing, which is fascinating, we were kind of downtown in New York one day at lunch and Ron said, Come on up to the apartment. I said, How far is it? He said, About 40 blocks. I said, We got a taxi. <laughs> oh, we won't. He said, We walk. And as we walked. As we came within about three blocks of his apartment, fellas started sticking their head out the door saying, Hey, Ronan! Hey, Ronan! Hey, Ronan! 
And he had reduced this part of New York to a village. Yeah. And and how are, how are things going for you at the moment? I mean, do you remember all that too? Because it is pretty remarkable to be show jumping with with no legs. Uh, well, you know what I mean. You know the, the, what I would say to you, Marion. How you say it's great to hear you, man. It how you doing? So great to hear you. Ah, sure. I'm grand. You know, I'm actually t- tonight. I have a show uh, in in Boston, but uh, to get up for you, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. Well, but, uh, appreciate it. You can have Not two breakfasts in the morning, hey, Roland. Happy se- uh, you, can, you can have two breakfasts in the morning. As and don't a, as worry, payback. I, still eat like, I still eat like a horse, believe he's, me. He's, I still like eat like the cow that I enjoy having a ride on. Right, <laughs> OK. Moya Doherty, good morning to you. Good morning, Marion. Good yeah, morning, Shay. Good Congratulations. morning, Moya. How you doing? Uh, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> you were involved in The Wireman. Yeah, Shay and I go back, and indeed uh, Shay goes back with John for decades. But when you live as long as Shay uh, has lived, uh, mm-hmm. thankfully he goes back a long way with many of us. Um, about six years ago, we produced The Wireman with Morris Cassidy and uh, Dennis Desmond, John and myself. And I've known Shay. I mean, I think I first met you, Shay, about 35 years ago when you were uh, working as a press officer for... RT Television 2 when I started working there as a PA but years later working as a producer with you as a writer, songwriter of a fully fledged musical, it was a really um, it was a lovely experience because you delivered a great piece of work and also were so present um, every day in the rehearsals working with the actors and the directors and the musicians uh, willing to change, to work with them, to guide them. And I think we're all very proud of that work um, that you created. And I gathered that your husband, John, John McCulgan, went away on his first holiday with Shay. Well, <laughs> Shay, it's up to me to tell this, but yeah. I promise I'll kind of tidy it up a little. Thanks, John, <laughs> John was 17 and Shay two years older. And I think Shay was a little bit more used to the alcohol than John. But the two of them headed off in some four-wheeled jalopy to um, Salt Hill, to a, a guest house, a boarding house in Salt Hill. And I think John had his first introduction to alcohol, a couple of pints. And they had the usual fish and chips. And the contents of the stomach ended up in the sink in the room of the boarding house (laughs) in Galway. (laughs) And uh, I think steel hangers and all sorts of things were used to try and unblock the sink unsuccessfully. But fade to black and fade up 50 years later, on the day of Shay's 70th birthday party, John went to a local pharmacy in Hoth in Dublin. Um, and one of the things he wanted to pick up, actually, on route was a birthday card for Shay. Right. In the chemist, in house, 50 years later, this woman walks up to him and said, you got sick in my sink <laughs> in Galway with Shay Healy. <laughs> and John said, well, actually, we're going to his 70th birthday tonight. And she said, hold on a minute. And she went off and got a birthday card and wrote it and gave it to John. And we brought it to Shay's party. Yeah. That's a terrific story, isn't it? Nice story, Gemma, yeah. Do you remember that, or were you... I do remember that. Or were you in such a condition that you mightn't remember it? We were were two really kind of middle-class Catholic boys in a terrible dilemma. (laughs) (laughs) Afraid to leave our room. (laughs) But also... um, Yes, yes, Moya. I just think the piece, too, about Shay that we all remember and love is that other really important part of Shay and Shay's life, which is Dimpna, his wife, who, um, you know, has been just so present in all of our lives with Shay and in everything that he's done. And we remember so vividly in the 80s, Shay, during all of your huge success, where the rest of us were struggling in dark, deep, depressed Ireland. You and Dimna hosted these incredible gatherings, eclectic gatherings in your home in Sandy Mount. Dimna did all of the cooking herself. And we just had, you brought an energy to all our lives then that none of us will ever forget. Well, that's pretty nice. It has to be said. And thank you very much indeed for that, Moya. I appreciate that. And thank you to Ronan Tynan. And it has just come up to 12 noon, so we have to pause for the Angelus. 
a uh, number of people saying, lovely to hear Shay Healy wishing him the very best. Happy birthday. I remember Shay in Liam's Irish Tavern in Massachusetts. And another one saying, this show is what radio is about. There you go, Shay. Uh, really loving it. Good luck to Shay and everyone involved. Would love to hear Shay's live version of What's Another Year. Well, we might or we might not, uh, that depending on what's going to happen. But I want to talk to a couple of other people now. We have Maura O'Connell coming up and we have Johnny Logan and we've Keith Donald. We'll start with you, Maura. Are you, can you remind me and remind Shay of how you guys met up? Well, um, I met Shay. Happy birthday, Shay. Thank you, Maura. Um, <laughs> I met Shay through uh, Morris Cassidy and uh, uh, Bill and a whole bunch of other than Brady. And, um, you know, it was just, you know, back then there was a fairly good community around town in Dublin and uh, he was very helpful with a very kind of um, much of a, a, a young, uh, co- completely clueless person up in, in Dublin. And uh, uh, I don't actually remember because it just seems like I always knew Shay once I got to Dublin exactly my first time. But I'm sure I was very impressed. So, Shay, uh, I just wanted to say, um, I, I wanted to remind you of your time in Nashville because uh, you had been there long before me. And uh, I loved your stories about all the people you knew, and uh, and I wanted to remind you of that. Well, uh, you're very kind. Nashville was um, the best place I ever lived, was outside it? of Dublin. Yeah. Why? Um, it's relaxed. It's chilled in, in a way that nowhere else in America is, and uh, they worship the song. They they revere the song. That kind of feeds into me as a personality. Right. If I didn't have the songs, I'd go crazy. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Same as all of us, Shay. Well, let me go to Johnny Logan as well, because um, certainly we all know the connection there with the song. Johnny, good morning to you. Good morning, Mario. Um, well, I presume your initial contact with this gentleman was the Eurovision. No, Shay, like Shay and myself know each other years. We knew, we knew each other from the Castle Bar Song Contest. My father knew Shay before I knew him. And I sort of... Um, We've been friends for, it seems like, uh, more than a lifetime. I think, sort of, I can safely say that, Shay. Yeah, you can. At um, this point, you know. But do you remember talking about Castle Bar, that... I, I can remember, like, sort of that line in the song that you wrote, like, sort of, if life's a bowl of cherries, why do I get all the pips? <laughs> that stuck with me. <laughs> that, that's one line that's Well, I remember from. that. But I think it, your best line was when my, um, my dad and me did the Late Late that time, and... Um, Dad was, you know, like the uh, got an attack of the Holy Spirit when we was on stage, when we were talking to Gay Byrne, and you know, like sort of he couldn't talk, he was just feeling God's love, and I explained to the camera, like sort of that at that moment that my father was filled with the Holy Spirit, and afterwards when I met you, you said to me, "That's a first for Gay," like sort of first time he ever had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit on the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that was one of your better lines, yeah. <clears throat> I remember. How are you, man? I'm good. I remember asking you in 1979 in Castlebar yeah. if I got a song into the national final, would you sing it for me? Yeah, yeah, and, that's where I remember that that conversation. And then the next day, you drove me country. home. You drove me back to Dublin, and somewhere along the road in Roscommon or whatever, we passed a car on the other side of the road the we, we were on, and I swore that. I'd certainly give him the song, but I'd never get into a car that was in game for the rest of my life. <laughs> I think, yeah, Jim O'Neill had that same thing about Ben. He said the same thing about me. I remember, I do vividly remember that, right? I, I was young. You know, what can I tell you? I was young. I've learned a lot, you know. You were beautiful. But, um, you were young and beautiful. I, I actually saw a clip yesterday. It was, was actually. Yeah. I never knew you felt quite that way about me, but I'd like, sort of, I've always loved you anyway, man. Well, uh, um, as you know, we're like sort of over the years, we've become more like brothers and like sort of family. And so much of very much, you know, And I'm, you know, I know you're celebrating your 70th year, and uh, you know, this is uh, you're one of the um, one of the things that people don't say about you. You're probably one of the wisest wisest people that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing in my life. I'd like to agree with that. <laughs> and I'd like to. I'd like, I, I, I like the fact that you agree with that, Shane, you know? No, I, I, Sean is, is, is great. We, he's known as Sean and as Johnny and several other names that I won't repeat. <laughs> but his generosity of spirits is still so wonderful. I had some Turkish people over for the Eurosong contest and he came out of the house and he sang Hold Me Now with just an acoustic guitar and it was spellbinding. It was one of the 
best thing I've ever seen and heard. And, and he spoke to them and cleared them in on the whole Eurovision thing. And that, that was just from the goodness of his heart, you know? Right. Oh, I said, a shame. I'd like to if I couldn't do that for you. But, you know, like, sort of, you know, I come to your house anyway quite regularly. I know Dimps, I know the, you know, like, sort of your whole family. And, like, sort of, the last time I think we saw each other was in, um, at Billy Connolly at the late, in uh, the Gaiety. And, we, like, sort of, you had um, uh, Fionn with you. Yeah. You know, um, sort of, um, the next generation, you know? Sean, you know I'm singing what's another year every now and again in different places, don't but you? Yeah, I heard, like, sort of, this is, people don't want me to sing it anymore. Like, yeah, said, yeah, like, yeah, sort of, just, you kind of ruined that for me now. I yeah. about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and and I wouldn't mind. That's my aunt Lucy's listening to me, and she listening to the radio now at the moment. She told me that, and sort of, uh, like, sort of the family Eilish and all them have said the same thing. Said you did a beautiful version. I wouldn't worry about it. I, I think uh, part of it, is it wouldn't work as a, just a sound thing. I think you have to see the the craggy face and and Shay, the that song was body. always your song. It came from your heart. It came from your it, pen. It did, it did. You know, I just interpreted it for you. You know, like sort of with a lot of help from you. And sometimes, and like uh, sort of, you never really got. You know, like sort of, I've only realised that after why me that the writer never re really gets the credit that they deserve you know and i kind of understand a lot more of the way you must have felt after what's another year and uh you know sort of your strength the character to carry on with that and still be so full of love for everybody else around and involved with that you're a lovely man there you go now another call <laughs> and i say that too you say that too. <laughs> this is good. Enjoy all of this now because the slagging presumably will start as well. But Brendan in Wicklow was on to say, my son wrote to Shay about Roy Rogers and he signed himself from Brian, aged nine. And Shay wrote back and signed Shay, aged 50. Nice touch. <laughs> Brendan in Wicklow. Roy Rogers. You did it to Roy that. Rogers, okay. yeah. I did a documentary with Roy Rogers yeah. in, in his home in Victorville in California a few years ago. And uh, he was an extremely nice gentleman. And he, he rode up in a big 750 Yamaha instead of on a horse, you know. And I climbed on the pillion. He gave me one of his six guns. And he had a museum which was a bit like a fort, a cavalry fort. And we drove around and around. And I mean, we shoot enough into the air, uh, sitting behind Roy Rogers. Not so bad. Keith Donald, good morning to you. Hello, Marion. How's it going? It's going very, very well indeed. I gather you were dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you're referring to... Uh, I, I was telling the story, Keith. What? I was telling the story about me, me interviewing you on Strawberry Fields Forever when I asked oh, you. Yeah. I'll that. never forget that. Uh, have you told the story already? I have, yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, I was dead for two minutes and ten seconds, Marion, in Port Leash Hospital, and a wonderful surgeon called Charlie McCormick got me going again. Get you away. Blame, you can blame him. So you have two lives. So, say again? So you got two lives. Yeah, yeah, I did. I got going again, yeah. Now, you worked with um, Shay on Nighthawks as well. Yeah, he uh, asked me to review uh, Clint Eastwood's film uh, on Charlie Parker. It was called Bird. And I went to the, the press screening in the morning and in the afternoon on out to Nighthawks uh, set for the um, rehearsal. And Shay had this idea that uh, I would start off that segment of the show playing the clarinet with the resident pianist. And Shay would start walking up the other side of the set and we would, I would put the clarinet down and we would join each other at the bar and talk about the film that I'd seen. And it went well, went, went really well at rehearsal a couple of times. Came the show in the evening, I'm playing the clarinet with the pianist, it's going okay, the camera's on me, life to the nation. Shay emerges on the other side of the set and begins his walk up to the bar. So I put the clarinet down on top of the piano and start walking to the, join him at the bar. And as he's halfway up the far side, a punter in a booth wants to say something to Shay and grabs him by the arm in a vice-like grip. And Shay isn't moving and I'm thinking, I'm going to arrive in minutes early at this bar on my own with the camera on me live to the nation. I'm wondering if I can start walking backwards, what will the camera do? Shay, meanwhile, is trying to get away from your man on the far side and say, no success at all. I arrived at the bar on my own and I thought, OK, I've got to look impatient or something. So I began drumming my fingers on the bar with the camera still on me. Shay eventually arrived at the bar and completely floored me saying, uh, what kept you? <laughs> 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 you 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 say that Nighthawks 
was your absolute favourite four years of your life? I think so, yeah, for, for several reasons. Uh, it was a collective experience which was brilliant and everybody who worked on the programme had, had an input and they could suggest whatever they wanted, right. from musicians to sketches to whatever. It gave a platform to people who wouldn't get on shows normally. Right. And it gave me a chance to exercise my... I always say that my education, the kind of Christian Brothers Reader's Digest education, and full of small scraps of information, and it gave me full, full reign on those when I was interviewing people. Right. And I really tried to get people off the, again off the beaten path, oddball characters to come in. Yeah. So it had a, a, a certain kind of renegade right. quality to it, which appealed to me, all oh, that to be a bit of an outlaw. Right. Uh, not part of the large consensus. And it influenced a whole generation in hindsight. But as I say, as a collective experience, when you're working on your own as a songwriter, as a singer, you spend a lot of time with yourself. And to spend time with other people in, in creative pursuits was a joy. Right, yeah. And of course, you just, as it were, brought down. Just brought down the government. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was just as a little aside. I've synthesised that whole thing now into a song, you know. The night they tore old Holly down, has bells, tills were ringing. The night they drove old Charlie down, all the people were singing. They said, na 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 na. <laughs> yeah, you needed the visual for that as well, with the finger on, on the nose. Listen, we have other people uh, lined up, including Kevin McAleer, but I just don't know if we're going to have the time to go uh, to them. Um, just before you go, Keith. Uh, uh, just like everybody else, how did you meet up with this guy in the first place? I met up with Shay, I think, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, there was a bunch of us used to meet every Monday night to, to have, a, have a drink or two. Uh, and Shay and Dimpna would have been amongst that bunch of people that included Jim McCann and Phil and Johnny McAvoy and Odette, Dave Pennyfeather, uh, lots of people. And um, Shay and Dimpna were a regular. Um, can I just say, Shay, that I just want to really embarrass you, but um, back then I always noticed that you were very kind to a new person coming into that group of people. You always made a point of bringing them in. You were very sensitive to them and trying to include them. And uh, I, I just thought that was a, a lovely kind of aspect of your generosity. Well, can I tell you that one night we left Keith home to he yeah. was living in Herbert Place at the time in the top floor yeah. flat, and we decided we, we, we would wait until he got in and was safely home. And we waited and waited and waited, and suddenly the top window opened and a saxophone came out and it went... Bum, 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 bum. And that was Keith. <laughs> right. OK, well, listen, thank you all very, very, very much indeed. Uh, thank you uh, to Keith. Thank you to Ronan Tyne and Maura O'Connell, uh, Moya Dardy, Paul Brady, Phil Coulter, Billy Connolly, and most importantly, uh, thank you to you, uh, Shay. And thank you for taking me by surprise, because I didn't anticipate any of this. I know that. That's all the better for it then, really, isn't it? Anyway, good luck to you. And good health to you. And if people want to find me, I'm on shayhedia.com. Right. OK, thanks a million. We'll take a break. 1850 715 150.